Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I want to talk about pageants for children, you know, like baby beauty pageants and young children beauty pageants. I want to, I did a mini deep dive on this and I want to look into the psychology of it. I want to look into the brief history of it. I want to look at the culture of it. And I want to try to have a balanced conversation around it, one that isn't bashing, but one that looks at it in a, in a clinical way, shall we say. So let's do that. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. This uh, idea came from patron Betts. They wrote, I am interested in the psychology of pageantry, particularly with children. I find it fascinating. Okay, so a brief history is that we can go back to, in the United States, in the 1850s, Phineas Barnum of, you know, Barnum and Bailey, uh, circus guy. I think there's a movie coming out about him soon with Hugh, Hugh Jack, not Hugh Jackman, Hugh Jackman? Uh, anyway, um, he actually, in the 1850s, way even before the Civil War, he held a beautiful baby contest. So he was all, always about spectacle, and that was one of the spectacles that he put on was, uh, you know, beautiful babies, <laughs> uh, which reminds me of Swingers, the movie. Um, also, there were uh, other baby beauty contests that were used as promotions for businesses, and it wasn't just for young girls, it was for young boys as well. So that is perhaps the, the genesis of it all. Then throughout the early 1900s into the mid-1900s, there's a, there's a lot of adult beauty pageants, uh, mainly for women or only for women. And then in 1961, the Little Miss America for Young Women uh, began. It probably as like, well, if, if America really loves adult beauty pageants, how about teenage? Well, and how about children? And so the 60s is when things kind of get started, which makes sense to me, uh, given my understanding of the, the 50s and 60s in terms of the culture and gender politics and Americanism at the time. Okay, skipping forward to 1995, you have John Benet Ramsey, six-year-old young girl. She's murdered. We, I actually did a mini deep dive into this topic, and just in summary, we still just we still don't know who killed her. I thought that was wrapped up. I thought the parents had done it. I, when I, I I I remember seeing the tabloids in the '90s, and my my takeaway was like, oh, the parents did it. But apparently, that's not necessarily true. I think the parents were accused, but anyway, the point is, is we still don't know who killed her, which means we probably never will, given that it's 22 years later. But this story was huge in the media in 1995, 1996. And when I think back on it, it's just like, huh, you know, isn't it interesting what America decides to focus on? <laughs> How many other child murders happened in that year that just were completely ignored. But for whatever reason, this one was fascinating to people. And it brought child pageants to the masses. I, I had never at that point heard about child pageants. And it was a very, it was, it was perhaps the most tabloidy thing about this whole thing was that you had these pictures of this four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old little, little girl, just a, just a normal kindergartner. And she's dressed up to look like like a sex object, and she looks like an adult with the you know with with the hairspray and the makeup and the dresses and the poses and it it had a very sick quality to it you know if if looked at in a certain way and so um, that's when pageants became much more popular to some extent but also infamous. Skipping forward to some other things in recent. Uh, you know, last 10 years, there was Little Miss Sunshine, the movie. There was a pageant that was sort of the climax of that movie. The TLC reality show Toddlers and Tiaras, which I think spawned Honey Boo Boo. Um, I, I, those kinds of things are completely off my radar. I don't watch reality TV. Um, when reality TV first came on, like Real World MTV, I watched, I remember watching that kind of, but I don't know. I, I'm just so 
I'm just not in that uh, target market. <laughs> I, the problem is for me is I'm such a skeptic that when I watch it, I am I'm looking for fakery essentially. I'm lo- I, and and there's just a ton of fakery in these reality shows, and I can tell. I think it's partially because. I've made videos and watched a lot of videos in my field, in the field of psychotherapy, in which people have to act like their clients. Because it, one of the problems in my field of psychotherapy is that uh, therapy offices are closed to the public, right? You can't observe ther- real therapy because of confidentiality and, uh, and other kinds of concerns like that. Whereas other professions like medicine, for example, you don't have necessarily that confidentiality or plumbing or how to chop down a tree properly. These are not confidential activities. And so as an apprentice, you can just watch experts go at it and learn from the, from what they're doing. Well, in psychotherapy, it's such a complex endeavor, such a complex profession. And yet most apprentice therapists have extremely limited access to actually watching therapy happen. Well, what we end up doing as a solution is we end up hiring actors or just getting class, you know, getting students together to role play as if they were clients. And as someone who has been involved in tens of thousands of therapy sessions, I can tell you that I've never seen a yeah, a, a role played therapy session that was convincing to me. There was one that convinced me early on, and then and after I don't know a few years after watching it occasionally, it suddenly occurred to me that it was fake. And so I remember that one kind of tricking me because it was done really well. But all the other ones I can tell. I, I can immediately tell. Oh, they're faking it. <laughs> they're not. That's not a real client. Be- so so in the same way, I when I watch reality TV, I'm like, oh, that person's playing it up or that, or our producer obviously told that person to say this or that. So anyway, this is just, I'm I'm not saying I'm better than anyone. You know, I I watch idiotic um, entertainment. So it's not like, you know, entertainment is entertainment. You watch it for fun. I've gone to pro wrestling matches, you know, WWE or whatever, and enjoyed the hell out of that. (laughs) And I know that's fake. I watch stupid movies sometimes. I, you know, so so this, I'm not, I, I watch robot chicken clips on YouTube late at night because I, I like to. <laughs> um, I watch like fail army videos because, you know, that's the por- sort of person I am. So I'm not saying, I'm, the only point is I'm saying I never watched Tyler's and Tierra's. I didn't even I, I barely knew about Honey Boo Boo. Is, that's my big point here. Okay. But I do know that some people really were fully into the Honey Boo Boo world, as far as I know. And I wonder how she's doing. I hope she's doing okay. Um, so, okay. So it brings us up. That's the sort of a brief history that brings us up to the current situation. Here are some interesting stats that I did not know. So out there in podcast land, just take a guess as to how many beauty pageants there are in the United States every, you know, every year. How many, how many beauty pageants do you think? If, if I was to take a guess, I would say, well, there's probably one in every state. And then you got like, you know, a few national ones. So maybe 200 at the high end. No, there are 5,000 beauty pageants in the United States every year. 5,000. 5,000. That means like every major city probably had, or with, you know, within, within the municipal, or within the, within the area of every major city, there's probably like a hundred to 200 beauty pageants. And I'm, and to me in Seattle, I, I don't know about a single one of those. The only ones that I know about are the ones I remember watching on TV in the 80s, which I assume are still happening, like Miss Universe and, you know, whatever that kind of stuff is. Um, so, and I've heard that Donald Trump likes to walk in on on the women when they're getting dressed. And so that that's another data point that's like, oh, beauty pageants are still happening. Anyway, also, each year uh, with with children, you know, minors, 
who are younger than 16, there are 2 million contestants, 2 million children, according to this one article, are competing each year in beauty pageants. And the, the age range goes all the way down to four months. Four months. Probably not a lot of four-month-year-old kids in beauty pageants. But the point is, is it goes down to four months and up to 15 years years of age. And But they're, they're probably, there's a lot of teenagers and a lot of grade school kids, you know. It's also big business. Pageants bring in these these child pageants bring in twenty billion dollars a year. There are uh, sponsors. There's fees. There's um, you know. There's just it's big business. Twenty billion dollars. It's sort of like the business of like Comic Con and Dragon Con and and PAX and stuff. You know, these are conventions targeted to a particular culture and. You, there's just a lot of money in it, you know, and child pageants is similar. Uh, the average cost of participating in a single competition for a, you know, to, in order to fund your child to go through these competitions, it, it, it's, it can range anywhere between $3,000 and $5,000. So it's probable that if you're a parent that has a kid in one of these beauty pageants, then it's likely you're doing more than one. And so at 5,000 bucks a pop, this is not a cheap thing because, you know, you've got a, there's entry fees, there's costumes, there's travel, there's, I don't know, just hotel. There's just all that kind of stuff that goes into it. And apparently it all kind of, it, ma- it amounts to quite a bit of, of money. Also, when you win these as children, you can win cash, prizes, you can win trips, you can win parts in movies and TV shows. So there's there's a lot at stake for some people. Okay. So I had no idea how big of a thing this was in the US. This is this is this is a big thing. It's big business. It's a microculture, but it's it's you know, with when you have millions of kids, two two million kids, I say. Yeah, two million kids in the United States doing this sort of thing, you know, that's that's a lot of people. Okay. So before going into the psychology of this whole thing, let's let's talk about the culture of this whole thing. You know, there there's an obvious cultural difference that we need to acknowledge and and slow down before we jump to any conclusions about this. Because my guess is is that people out there who consider this to be a foreign culture are probably aghast at it. It's like, what, you're gonna put your four month old in makeup and do all this kind of stuff? Like that is 100% wrong. I I can't believe you're doing this. Uh, There's something wrong with you. You know, there's a, so I'm gonna go into the harm because there definitely is harm. But before doing that, I want to, again, provide some balance to this that I genuinely feel in my heart to be necessary to talk about. Um, you know, it one, not all of these uh, pageants, children are being harmed in all likelihood, um, which I'll get more into in a second. But, you know, it's if, if you just take it, if, if we don't think about pageants, we can all identify with this. Most parents will put their kids in plays at the holidays, you know, like the school will put on a holiday play and the kids have to dress up in these really hot, sweaty outfits and they have to prance around on the stage and and they might feel a lot of pressure. I remember actually when I was a kid, I, I was a musician as a child and felt tremendous pressure. Now, most of that was just because of me. I don't, I don't think my parents really cared about me being a musician, but, but one could argue that I probably should have just not been playing on stage as a kid because it was just so, I, I, it really tore me apart. I would lie awake at night worrying. So it's not foreign to most of us to have kids performing on stage, doing something. And so... Um, another sort of example of this is sports culture with kids. 
a lot of parents will sign their kids up for sports or for dance recitals or for um, and you know when you watch the when you watch six seven year olds doing anything along these lines it's always terrible <laughs> you know they're kids um, I was actually editing some video of my younger brother playing t-ball in the 80s and it's comical. They're terrible. They have no idea what they're doing. They're they're just like, huh? I hit this ball. Okay, fine. Hit the ball. And then they hit the ball. And then all the parents and coaches are just run. And 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 they're like, huh? Where? And they're like, run to that to that bag over there. And they're like, what do you mean? Just run. And they're like, okay. And so they sort of trot over and they step on the bag and like everyone's clapping and they're looking at the crowd and they're like, is everyone clapping for me? Like they just don't know what's happening. And, you know, one could argue that, uh, why are we doing that? Are, we're doing that? are we doing that for the kids? Are we doing that for us? Are we doing it because it's cute and it amounts to like a funny video you can post on Facebook? It's, it, it, you know, a lot of questions could be asked about, shall we say, more popular activities that parents will do for kids. So so it's not like the, the pageants are alone in, in these elements. It's particular in that it has, uh, it, you know, the makeup and the poses and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it, it's it's not unusual for parents to force their kids to get on stage, even when they don't really want to, and uh, for, for the enjoyment of a crowd, <laughs> you know. Um, now, I'm not saying that all that activity is good. That, that's not my point. My point is, is that... I want to talk about the balance here because I I initially when I was walking into this semi deep dive was like this is a ridiculous culture this is stupid uh, I didn't know how many people were doing it um, somehow that makes it so that I'm thinking well if there's if there's two million kids I just have to believe that a majority of those parents love their children and care about their children and and would not want to harm their children. So I have to I have to assume that most kids are not being harmed significantly <laughs> by this. There there must be something actually that that's good that's coming out of this, you know. It can't all be bad, right? Um be, uh, most mostly because at, at my age I've I've had a lot of times where I've looked at another culture and thought that's dumb. And then the more I get to know it, I'm like, oh, I get it. I just, I just didn't understand it. And so, with this pageant thing, I, I assume that if if I grew up in that culture, I, I would probably be able to see a lot of the benefits. Um, you know what what the people will say in terms of the parents, what they'll say that it helps kids with is it helps them with their confidence, it helps them with their public speaking. Um, it helps them get along with other people. It helps them learn how to tolerate how to lose. Um, they're not saying that, but that's what I imagine one parent might say. Uh, some parents say that it helps these young people to learn how to discipline themselves. Now, maybe they wouldn't say that about a four-month-old, but may, maybe they'll say that about a 12-year-old. You know, Maybe a 12-year-old learning how to um, discipline themselves and put their mind to something is, you know, that's not a bad thing. Um, and it's similar to the way that we pressure kids with sports, right? You know, you, you put kids into sports because you want them to get along with other people. You want them to learn how to do teamwork. You want them to learn how to take direction, how to, how to work hard, how to have fun. And the, the pageants seem to be a similar activity for, for these parents. Again, I'm going to get into the obvious problems with pageants in a second. But before we do that, let's just continue down this road. Um, so so let me give an example. Uh, I, I'm planning for January events, you know, in my life, uh, weekend events. And whenever I'm planning with other people, they're like, okay, well, so what, what? I, I was in a meeting recently and, and they're like, okay, so let's schedule our, ne our next meeting for January sometime. And immediately I'm like, well, when I have the live event coming up January 27, 2018, Antioch, Seattle, three o'clock, um, we might do a live podcast the night before too, not sure. But anyway, um, so, so when it, but it, the other thing that's happening in January 
on the other weekends is is football. You have the playoffs in January. And so and bowl games cuz the Huskies, you know, they'll play in a bowl game. Anyway, my point is is that I chose January 27 because that's the bye week for football because the the NFC AFC Championship is the weekend before and the Super Bowl is the weekend after. So that's why I chose because there's a chance one that the Seahawks will go or two that I'll be interested in the, in the other kinds of games. And so as so I'm in this meeting and they're like um let's schedule our next meeting for the a weekend in January and immediately I'm like oh crap like um I can't do it the weekend of the 27th because that's our live podcast that's our you know our live event thing and then I'm like well all the other weekends I know are potential Seahawks playoff days. Um Seahawks are going to have to get pretty lucky to get into the playoffs this year, but you know, you never know. And so I I started to say that. I said, well, you know, there's there's the there's the playoffs and the Seahawks might get in. And everyone around the table was looking at me like, huh? Like, who are the Seahawks? <laughs> you know, or why do you care about that? Or or really? We we have to we have to we have to um our our schedule has to be subservient to your stupid thing that you watch on TV. Can't you just record the game or something? And you know, to other Seahawks fans or other football fans, they'll be like, "Well, of course you got to plan around the playoffs." I mean, that's just that's just the reality, especially if your team might go to the playoffs. I mean, you're not going to miss the the AFC uh, or NFC Championship game if your team is in it, and definitely the Super Bowl. Blah blah. So, but to everyone around this table, table, my little microculture about football watching is ridiculous to them. And they're all looking at me like, huh? And so, so now does that mean that I am ridiculous because I was the minority in that situation? No, it just means that I am in a cultural pocket that um, values that quite a bit. That would, you know, there are things that like, I've often thought about this. I've often thought, okay, if the Seahawks were in the conference championship or the Super Bowl, uh, what would have to what what would um, uh, what what would trump m- those events for me? You know, would would my best friend's wedding trump it? <laughs> would um, I don't know some uh, like a like a baby shower or what what would what would make it so that i would miss the game and have to watch it later and and i don't know the answer to that uh, but the the point is is that that's a big deal to me and to other people they're just like that's so stupid football is dumb i mean i i have friends who have just said straight to my face like you're stupid for watching football it's a dumb sport and um it's terrible to people and da da da, da. and i'm just like okay that's cool that that's what you think, but you don't, you just don't, I guess you don't like football, you know, and and that's fine. So we have to be careful when we look at pageants because it's something that, that many of us just don't value. You know, we, we look at it and we think, well, that's dumb. Well, why even do that? But to the people that are in it, it could be the most important thing in their life. And and just because we don't understand it or don't value it doesn't mean that it's that it's uh, invalid to other people. Also, we have to seriously consider the possibility that we've only seen what the media wants us to see when it comes to this. You know, my guess is is that in the media, the ninety nine point nine 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 percent of what's in the news and what's on the internet are the most shocking, terrible cases like Jean Benet Ramsey. I think when I was Googling around, I think I couldn't avoid the Jean Benet Ramsey uh, case. So if you do any kind of child pageantry search, I think Jean Benet Ramsey is like most of what you find. And, and so, you know, just imagine that. Imagine, you know, for me, it's like every time you searched for NFL or every time you search for Seattle Seahawks, it was like one particular person 20 years ago who, who died, um, who, who happened to be a Seahawk, you know, it's just, it's like Jean Benet Ramsey was murdered and that's terrible. And she happened to be involved in something that millions of other kids are involved in. So uh, it, it's tempting to say like, well, 
this sort of activity leads to kids being murdered. <laughs> but of course, that's ridiculous, right? So, you know, for example, whenever I think about this, I think about how whenever anything bad happens in Seattle, all of my friends and relatives who live outside of Seattle, they'll call me to see if I'm okay. But I'm always okay. <laughs> and I'm always like, I'm always wondering like, man, what is the news saying to you that makes you think I, I'm in danger? You know, like the battle in Seattle. If, you know, I think it was the World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle. There was, there was a, a big protest and, and many peaceful protesters, but there was a small set of people who took it to the next level. And then the, the riot police got involved and blah, blah. But, um, and I lived, um, did I live downtown at the time? I think I did. I think I lived, well, at any rate, I, I lived you know, within a mile of the action. And, but the media outside of Seattle made it look like the entire city was in flames. <laughs> but, but really, it was only a few blocks downtown. And even then, it was only for a few brief moments, really. But the media would run to the action, film it, and then play it over and over and over again on the on news channels across the United States. And, and so consequently, all my friends and relatives outside of Seattle would call me like, Oh, my God, are you okay? You got to get out of the city. And I'm like, I'm like, the, the, the this is only Seattle's a huge place one two, what's what's what you're seeing in the media has, has only been happening down by the courthouse. And, and even then, it was only for brief moments. It's not like it's not like the city is like under siege or something. Now I'm I'm being a little exaggerated because because it, it did sort of migrate up to uh, Capitol Hill and um, anyway. It, but the point is is that I I was totally safe. <laughs> there was nothing. Uh, so when we look at the media coverage of of uh, you know child pageants, we have to assume that the media is feeding us the most shocking cases because that's how they make their money is to keep us watching. If if there was a a news story that said that said child pageantry not harmful to kids, you know, seemingly okay. <laughs> that's not no one's going to watch that because they're just going to be like, "Huh, well anyway." You know, but if you said a 5-year-old in pageant runs away from home because of pressure, you know, that's going to that's going to be a news story. Anyway, um, so we really just have to consider all of this, and we have to consider that there's a very high likelihood that we really just don't know what's happening on the ground level. Um, plus, again, when I hear about millions of parents having their kids do this sort of thing, I just have to assume that the vast majority of those parents really love and care about their kids. It's a biological mandate that you protect your children from harm. And so I just assume that it, it can't be as bad as I think it is. Let's just put it that way. Having said all that, let's move on. But before we do that, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't already, and you're interested in a book on clinical supervision, or you're just interested in psychotherapy in general, you might be interested in my new book, which is called Multi-Role Clinical Supervision, and it's available on Amazon. So go to Amazon, buy my book called Multi-Role Clinical Supervision. It's been getting some good reviews, which has made me feel uh, very, very good, <laughs> because it's my first book, and I am very interested to hear what people have to say. So another thing is, is if you've read it, particularly if you liked it, go to Amazon and review it. That would be super cool of you. Okay. Also, if you haven't become a patron of the podcast yet, go to patreon.com, become a patron. That's one of the best ways you can show your love for this program called Psychology in Seattle. Okay, so let's look at some of the problems here that are pretty obvious. Well, First off, let's look at some of the facts here. There are a lot of things that these, because these are beauty pageants, right? And they might not be officially called beauty pageants, but that's essentially what they are. And even though they often try to say that they're related to, um, you know, talent or, or the ability to give a good speech or something, 
they're often very much based on the way that you look uh, on stage and the way that you move and stuff. And so as a result, there's there's a lot of things that they do to these kids that we we just have to acknowledge that is happening. One of the thing that the main thing that they do to to young kids is they they and maybe even young teenagers is is they make them look old. They make the children look like they are adults. And you do this in a number of different ways. One, the main way is, is you put a S ton of makeup on these kids. And if you go online, you could see examples of this. It's shocking. It's the, the, the transformation from a cute six-year-old into what looks to be a grown woman with just makeup is astounding to me. Now, I'm not going to label it pathological per se. We'll look into that in a second. But but it's interesting, right? When you play, when you when you ask your kids to play t-ball, there isn't that, right? You're you're only asking kids to hit a ball and act like act like they know what they're doing with sports, <laughs> and that's different than standing in front of a mirror and meticulously transforming your look, right? They will wear false teeth. Uh, this I found to be very interesting is that, you know, one of the markers of what a child is, is children have gaps in their teeth, right? Because they have baby teeth still, or their, their head is still growing, you know? And so in order to make children look like adults, you, you make them wear false teeth where it looks like a, a, a set of adult teeth and their smile looks much more like an adult. And, and I, when I looked at the before and after on those false teeth things, I was like, wow, that really does make a big difference. You know, it it must be kind of programmed in our head that children have a different look to their teeth. You know, they, they will also in some rare cases will have their kids do spray tans, even very young kids, like, like toddlers will have spray tans. They, in some even rarer cases, they will actually have the children have fake breasts and fake hips to make them look like they have a, a body of a, of a woman. It's very off-putting. Now, these are, I think the, the over-the-top stuff is rare. But at the very least, there's, there's a lot of makeup and a lot of this sort of thing. Now, I'm sure there are pageants where, and I, I remember read actually, I remember reading about some pageants where they actually don't allow that. They'll just say, your kid has to look natural. You can't, you can't do anything to, you know, their, you can't put makeup on their face and you can't have them wear false teeth. And, you know, maybe you can comb their hair, but that's about it. So there's different kinds of pageants out there. The, the main problem that I can see with, these sorts of things is the pressure that it puts on kids. You know, imagine this, you're five, you're four, you know, just go back to when you were that age. And, and I'll use myself as a, as an example. When I was five, I had no idea how the world worked. I I remember just being boggled by the adult world. One example that I talk about on the podcast sometimes is watching my mom write checks, write bank checks to you know, at the grocery store or something. And I was just like, so all she has to do is just write a check and she gets things and she, and she has thousands of checks. So my mom can just buy anything she wants is, is the impression I got. And I remember one time asking her like, so sometimes you say you can't afford things, but I don't get it because you have checks in your purse. So, and she, she explained it to me, but it just went completely over my head because because my brain just wasn't able to process that sort of stuff. And so five-year-old kids, young kids, their, their brains just aren't ready for certain things. And even though we'd like to think that they are, or even though we would like to um, prop them up as, as that way, that they just don't understand a lot of things. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago that they couldn't even speak a language, let alone, you know, understand the nuances of a beauty pageant and of, and of society and of gender and of sexuality and all that kind of stuff. So as a five-year-old, you, in, in some of these pageants, 
you're, you're put under a tremendous amount of pressure to look perfect and to smile perfect. You know, imagine you're in that makeup chair and as a five-year-old, you have to sit still and you're, your parents are like, sit still, honey, you have to, you have to be still. And you're just like, oh my God, like, get me out of here. And then you can't roll around in the dirt, like the way kids want to, you can't run around. You have to stay very still because your hair is just right. And then you've, you've, you know, cause pageants I'm guessing are hours long affair, you know? And so it's, it's probably like all day long where the kids, you know, and kids need naps and stuff. And, and so, uh, you know, and then you got to get on stage and you got to perform just right. And, um, you know, it's hard. Uh, you probably can't really express your real feelings. It's, it's probably considered a huge failure if you go out on stage and you just start crying, you know, um, that's, it's probably too much pressure for children. I, it's just, that's, that's my guess. There's, I, I tried to find research on this and I, I couldn't find any. I think there are some, research, but it's a hard thing to research, honestly, because it's how do you measure any kind of harm happening to kids because of this sort of thing? You know, you'd have to do some kind of longitudinal study of some kind and um, and maybe certain kinds of parents only sign up ki- kids for this sort of thing. And so maybe that's a factor that would play in, the, in this. But anyway, my hypothesis, my speculation is that for many of these kids, it's too much pressure. To me, if if you did one of those natural pageants, that seems like it would reduce a lot of that. If the pageant was taken less seriously, I think that would reduce the harm. You know, if there wasn't so much uh, hanging on it, like if if the prizes were just like kind of minor, like just little trophies or something. Um, you know, if if kids were allowed to opt out at any point, you know, if they had a tantrum at some point, you'd just be like, okay, well, I guess. No big deal. Uh, Jenny had a tantrum and, and, you know, so Jenny, do you not want to do the rest of this activity? No, I don't want to. Okay, that's that's cool. You know, we'll go home and we'll do something else. So if there's flexibility in there, I, I to me, that would probably be fine. But it's the rigidity of it and it's the social pressure involved that is put on everybody, the parents and the kids. And so uh, I just have to imagine that it can't be that can't be overall good for, for most kids. The other problem here is that it really emphasizes how, how these children look and particularly how these little girls look, which you got to figure is going to increase the chance of eating disorders and body dysmorphia and self-esteem problems. You know, Michael Jackson, you could say his primary uh, pathology was related to this as a young person in the seventies, he was young, he was cute. He had a really high voice. He had a, he had an almost soprano, beautiful voice that at a young age, like at the age of seven and 10, he, he was, he was singing adult songs. You could even say Michael Jackson was in a way kind of like a child pageant kid because they toured the world and he danced and he, he was the star of the Jackson five. You had, you had Michael Jackson, and the, then you had his four old, four of his older brothers, and the parents were just putting tremendous pressure on them, and then society, and you know, just think about that pressure for for a young developing brain. And as he started to grow up through the off the wall years and Thriller, and then Bad, he started to become a man, just like his older brothers, meaning that his voice started to drop, his body was changing. And I think that that was very distressing for him. And I think that he wanted to retain his childhood qualities because that's where his self-esteem came from, was from, and that's the only place it came from, apparently, was his ability to sing like a, like a child. And so, you know, again, it's a lot of speculation there, but the... Uh, you know, when you put that much pressure on children, there's a you're raising the risk of some psychological issues. Let's just put it that way. Another problem with this whole thing is that these a lot of these pageants, not all of them, but a lot of the child pageants make these children, these young girls, look like adult sexual objects. And on one level, it's 
culturally distasteful, right? It's just like, ew, that's gross. But another thing is, is that that, that amounts to sexual abuse. If, if it is taken a certain way by the kids, that will absolutely have similar effects as child sexual abuse. When, when you, for example, as a, as an adult, expose a child to pornography, even though you never touch the child or abuse the child, if, if a five-year-old watches adult level, you know, hardcore pornography, that will mess with a child's head. If you say to a child when they are five that they look sexy, or when you make them really understand that they are a sex object, their their little brains cannot handle that kind of stuff. And they will grow up with, with problems, with their self-esteem. They'll think that it's okay for other people to exploit them. They'll think that um, they'll, they'll have their self-esteem kind of wrapped up in their ability to, to turn people on. And they might also feel traumatized by by being afraid of stepping outside of that. So so when we sexualize young children in this way, it's not automatic, but you raise the risk significantly that, that there's going to be effects later on that we would call as the result of childhood sexual abuse. For example, one, there was a one account in which a child, a young child was dressed up in a Playboy bunny costume and her father carried her out on the stage dressed as Hugh Hefner. So now the child probably doesn't know who Hugh Hefner is, probably doesn't know, who, you know, the Playboy bunny th- situation. So maybe the kid's just like, oh, that's funny. I, my dad's carrying me out on stage and I, I'm dressed like a bunny. Isn't that sort of funny? But, you know, it, there's, it raises the risk of that child realizing what's happening or having a vague idea about what's happening and, and, and having that get under their skin in, in a really bad way. The other thing is, is that, how many of these people, there's actually a, it's always sunny in Philadelphia episode about this. How many of these, uh, these people in the audience are attracted to children as sex objects in reality, right? I'm not going to, it's a very tempting thing to say. It's like, oh, child pageants, they're just for pedophiles and stuff. And, and I imagine that that's not the case for the vast majority of situations, but when you when you sexualize kids, you just invite that sort of element, I think, and that can't be ignored. The, th- the other thing that I read in one article that they were saying is that there's, you know, we have in our country and in a lot of countries, we have what we call child labor laws where you can't make children work or there's extreme limitations based on age to how long a child can be expected to work, right? And and yet these pageants, for some of them, you could consider them to be child labor, because especially when you consider price the the cash prizes that are involved in this. Basically, you have parents who want a cash prize and are putting their kids to labor to win that prize. And so there's a there's a child labor law. Question element to this. Now, if we applied child labor laws to pageants, then we would also need to apply that to other activities that that kids do, right? Um, like t-ball and that kind of stuff. So maybe there's a problem with that. But anyway, it's just an interesting kind of angle to look at it. Another problem is health issues and other kinds of health-related things. Like, for example, there was one account. So, so this one woman went undercover, I think, into the pageant, child pageant world and made all these observations. And one of the things that she found was that parents gave their children a lot of caffeine, a lot of caffeinated beverages, and also a lot of candy. And one, and, and there was a certain cultural pocket where they referred to uh, pixie sticks or, you know, candy for kids. They called it pageant crack, you know, pageant crack. Um, and they do this to keep the kids energetic because like I said, the, the pa- these pageants can last all day long, and so the kids get tired and they need a nap, and they the the parents 
or like we can't let this kid sleep because they'll they'll mess up their hair and their makeup and blah blah blah. So we need to keep them up until the end here, and then as soon as the thing's over, then they can take a nap. And one parent was heard saying, "We've gone through two bags of crack and two cans of energy drinks, so she can stay up for the crowning." So now now again, there's other parent behavior that is similar to this that's outside of pageants when when parents for example bring their kids to a to a thanksgiving thing a lot of parents are like i really hope that our kid uh, stays um, in control and doesn't have a meltdown and and if you have a kid who has a lot of meltdowns you've you've probably resorted to some interesting things to try to manage that <laughs> things that if people looked at it from the outside they'd be like wow like that doesn't seem right um, whether that's related to some dietary thing or some iPad thing or whatever. There's, sometimes you get desperate with kids. Um, having said that, a culture that basically um, makes it necessary to feed caffeine and pageant crack to, to young children should probably look at itself in the mirror and wonder if it's gone too far. Like I said, if if you just if it's flexible, if it doesn't involve pumping your kid full of caffeine and sugar, if it's just kind of like a, a harmless, casual affair, then then I I that would be great. So anyway, let's let's go on to some of the lingo that's used to discuss this. One one phrase or term in the literature is what what they call benign achievement by by proxy benign which means non-harmful achievement by proxy so this is not dsm lingo and it's not really even clinical language as far as i can tell this achievement by proxy phrase is used only by a small set of authors and very limited research in this area so you should know that but anyway Achievement by proxy is the very normal thing that parents will feel when their kids achieve things, right? So when, you know, you'll, you've all seen this, right? When you go to a soccer game for kids, the parents really want their kids to succeed. And when their kids score a goal, the parents are jumping up and down. They're like, yay, Johnny scored a goal. Oh, this is so great. And when the when Johnny doesn't do well, then the parent doesn't feel so great about that. And and it's 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 a form of empathy in a way, really. And it's a form of family pride and it's all normal. Um and so they have this label for that called benign achievement by proxy, which is just that that non harmful process that that all parents engage in, right? You know. Uh, my kid is an honor student bumper sticker, for example. It's like, okay, great. Your your kid is an honor student, but you're not. <laughs> so, uh, you know, your kid can walk around with I'm an honor student, which makes sense. But, but, uh, but anyway. So it's so it's normal to to take pride and to feel a sense of achievement yourself when your kid achieves something. Um, <laughs> I have a very uh, the first time I really felt because. I grew up in a sport playing family, me and my siblings and my, uh, and my parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents. My, my grandfather, actually, the Japanese-American, was a famous sport, was a famous athlete. He, he played baseball primarily, but he also played football and basketball and track. And he was um, famous in the Japanese-American community in, in, the, in the United States. And he almost played professional baseball in Japan, but he needed help out on the farm in in Washington. So Japan actually was trying to recruit him from the United States. Anyway, so he was sort of like a reverse Ichiro, if that makes any sense. Um, anyway, so when I was growing up, a lot of I played a lot of sports, and so I would see my older siblings and my parents and my aunts and uncles and my grandparents. Everyone would be cheering me on and blah blah blah. So I definitely got that from that angle. But then with my little brother, I remember I was, I was probably like 16 and my dad 
said to me, he's like, Kirk, I can't, I have this work thing. I can't go to Kevin's, my little brother, Kevin. I can't go to Kevin's wrestling match. So you have to go and you have to film it for me. And this is the, you know, those big clunky video cameras that you had to carry the VCR with you. And then the camera was separate from the VCR. And um, so just give you a visual. And so I went, yeah, sure. So I went to my little brother's wrestling match and I filmed it. And I, I, and I'm a wrestler too. Like it was perhaps my best sport. I was, um, I didn't like wrestling for a number of reasons because it was a, a tremendous amount of pressure because it's just one-on-one in the spotlight, like a boxing match. And I like team sports because you could kind of spread the wealth in terms of the pressure a little bit. <laughs> like football was my favorite game to play, um, uh, sport to play, but but wrestling, I was probably the best at. And so when I was watching my little brother wrestle, I totally felt that benign achievement by proxy where everything he did, I felt in my own body. I'm like, okay, get him in the, you know, okay, get that, you know, get low and, you know, keep your, keep your uh, momentum. And, you know, I'm just, I'm, I, and then, and you, the funny thing is, is as I'm filming my little brother, I would forget I was filming and I would, the camera would, would, you know, if you're watching the video, it's like occasionally I wouldn't be filming my little brother because I'd be lowering the camera because I'm freaking out and you can hear me saying things, you know, like, okay, okay, you got it. Okay. No, get out of that. You know, you can hear me just like completely losing my S as uh, my little brother is struggling with this wrestling match. And I remember after that, uh, I was like, oh man. And there's just, there's this video evidence of, of my emotionality as I watched my little brother wrestle. And I remember going to my parents and saying like, I get it. I now get why you guys freak out so much when I play sports. Cause you just, you just want your, your family, your little family member to, to win. You know, you, you have so much empathy for your, for your family that you just, you just, you want them to win and, and you see them making a mistake and you're like, no, no, no. You know, you just, and it becomes this overwhelming emotion that just sort of, sort of like just bursts out of you, you know? And so whenever I see those, those um, shame videos of parents freaking out on the sideline, you know, some of those parents are ridiculous and they have, they probably have been traumatized in some way. And, and that's what I see. Whenever I see those parents just like completely losing their s, um, uh, you know, they're getting in fights with their ref and stuff. I'm just like, well, that that parent probably has some PTSD around authority and around this sort of stuff. But but anyway, when I see parents just going crazy, I'm like, well, I know what that feels like. <laughs> and, and although I for a time I didn't know what that felt like, and I was like, why is everyone just going nuts? You know. And then I was like, oh, I get it. Because you know, when 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 it's your when it's your kid or your brother and they're, and they're small and you're protective of them and you want, and you know how important it is for them to achieve. It just, it just takes over. So that's what we call benign achievement by proxy. And that's something that applies to pageants is parents get really into it in the same way that I got really into my younger brother and his wrestling uh, parents goal of beauty pageant kids will get really into it. Um, but there's this other thing that where they call in the literature achievement by proxy distortion. So achievement by proxy distortion is, is not benign. It is harmful. Basically parents and perhaps coaches will feel too much vicarious enjoyment through their kids. And it leads to the, it leads to the activity becoming more about the parents and the coaches than about the kids themselves. And, it, it raises the risk of harm to children. But to me, this is difficult to determine, right? It's hard to draw the line between parents that are very encouraging or just really into their benign achievement by proxy and whether or not it's gone too far. It's, it's just hard to tell because, again, different cultural pockets will value different things, you know? And so, you know, uh, someone would look at my Seahawks stuff and be like, you're taking it too far. That's dumb. But people in my culture would say, 
no way. <laughs> like I've been waiting all year for this to happen. And so there's no way I'm going to miss it. You know, it's a big deal to me. I, in my neighborhood, I can look out the window right now and my neighbors, uh, just two doors down, I can see on their house, they have a giant Seahawks logo on their house and it's permanent. It's not, uh, and this is a nice, the, two, do, two doors down, it's a nice house. It's like, you know, built 10 years ago and they have a, they have a, a big garage slash um, sort of like Fonzie mother-in-law apartment thing. And on the, on the garage is this, is this big uh, Seahawks l- label, permanent, you know, not just on game day, permanent. Uh, uh, down the road about a block, there's a house that has a permanent 12 in lights on its roof. 12 is like the 12th man, they call it, um, which is like the 12th. The fans call themselves the 12s because they're, they're like, because you have 11 football players on the field and then we're like the 12th one on, you know. So permanent on this house is a light, you know, like Christmas lights and there's a huge 12. Permanent, okay? Anyone that doesn't watch the Seahawks or or hates football will just look at that and go like, what is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> like that's just so dumb. Uh, but, you know, to Seahawks fans, it's just like, well, yeah, of course, you know, I mean, it, it's it's a big deal. So anyway, um, I think that it would have to be looked at on a case-by-case basis. You'd really have to, you couldn't look at it from the outside and go like, oh, that's harmful to kids. I think you could look at it from the outside if you knew enough about it and say, well, that's, that's increased risk of harm to kids. But it's hard to know. And because some kids just roll with the punches, you know, they're just like, yeah, whatever, you know, yeah, they're pressuring me, but, you know, whatever. Whereas other kids, the tiniest bit of pressure, like even just playing t ball, can be harmful. And I just want to stress that here because it's not that, oh, pageants are bad and t ball is okay. What the point is, is that every kid has to be evaluated individually because every kid's different. And, you know, for instance, for me, if I could go back in time, I don't. I don't know exactly what I would have done about like certain things that I felt tremendous pressure around, but I kind of wish that I didn't sign up for so much things on stage when I was a young kid, because, um, you know, during those, during the years of like fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, those were very hard years for me in terms of being on stage for whatever reason, I couldn't really think through those situations. It was it was very distressing for me to be on stage. And yet somehow I always found myself on stage. <laughs> and I wish someone would have said to me like, "You know, Kirk, you you probably should stop signing up for things on stage, you know? You don't have to do that. Uh, how about just have fun, you know, just relax and and just have a good time. Let someone else do the stage stuff." And I I think I would have appreciated that. I think I assumed I had to or something. Um, anyway, so, but I wasn't doing beauty pageants. I was just, I was just playing the trumpet or I was just uh, running for student, um, you know, the ASB president or something. Um, it, it, to me and to, and to people on the outside, they'd be like, oh, well, good. You know, he's a musician. He's playing the trumpet. That's, that's good. You know, and he's, he's got a hobby, you know, but internally, I, I don't think it was, I don't know, you know, it, there's a, there's a chance that I actually got more good at than bad out of those things, but I don't know. It's just hard to tell. So the same goes for, I think, child beauty pageants is it's like, well, for some kids, it might be fine and might actually even enhance their life. But for other kids, it might not. And it you can't tell by the activity is the point. I think we can all agree that uh, making five year olds look like sexualized adults is probably not a good. Or let's just let me phrase it differently: making young children look like sexualized adults is at the at at least it raises the risk of harm, right? And it's totally unnecessary. There's so many other kinds of things you can do f- regarding pageants for children that don't involve that, right? 
and I and like I said, there are many pageants that don't even that actually don't even allow that. They're like, no, 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 you can't put makeup on that kid. That's you know, that's not we're that's not that that's not what this pageant is about. So I, I think that there are certain things that we could say are probably uh, at, at the very least unnecessary and and at the most might be risking serious harm to children and subtle harm, you know, like harm that you wouldn't necessarily even recognize at all harm like uh, uh, a young a young girl growing up and feeling like she is only as worth her worth is completely based on the way she looks and not on how she thinks or you know the things she can do or that kind of stuff and that's something that a lot of young girls have happened to them anyway even if they're not in a pageant so so it, it's a reflection of the larger cultural marginalization and oppression and and socialization regarding gender um so so that's a whole other topic that i didn't really discuss very much is that gender is a massive part of this thing and gender politics is a massive part of this thing and as we progress as a society and as we look more critically at traditional gender socialization i think pageants are going to change over time um and and actually i haven't talked about the fact that a lot of young boys are involved in these pageants too uh, but it's a majority girls but anyways so as we look more critically at gender socialization as we uh, become more woke to gender politics my guess is over the next 50 100 years child pageants will either disappear or they'll look really different uh, at least that's my hope all right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me. Please take care of yourself. Let me know what you think. If you feel like it, you can email me at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. I read every single email. A lot of you will email me and be like, um, you know, I don't know if you're actually going to read this email or sorry for emailing you and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just here to tell you, like, one of my missions in my life is interacting with you guys. So, if you email me, don't apologize. It's fine. It's great. I, I, I Every morning I open up my email and I, I look at uh, the various messages and and I respond. The one thing I'll ask is that you try to keep it concise. If you, if you have just paragraphs of stuff, it it's a little laborious to read it because sometimes I feel like I, I can't really respond unless I read the whole thing. So uh, sometimes just, just give me the concise... Uh, overview and then maybe as we go back and forth you can give me some more background because sometimes it's like i might i sometimes i ask people i'm just like your concise question leads me to believe that there's a there's a backstory to this do you do you care to share that with me and so that's the one thing i ask is just i don't know, just try to keep it try to keep it short because <laughs> um, oftentimes honestly when i read long emails i'll be like you know a lot of that background could have been condensed to, to a couple sentences. And um, anyway, having said all that, it's not like I'm upset by it. It just means it makes it harder for me to get to every, every email. <laughs> but anyway, I read every email. I do. I read every, I read every comment on YouTube, which can be disastrous for, for my self-esteem. Um, so yeah, contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Particularly if you are involved in this culture, if, if you have kids or you know kids who are involved in pageants, these pageants, I, I'm dying to hear from you guys. So let me know. Let me, and let me know what you think about what I've been saying. Did I, did I um, make you feel like crap? <laughs> um, let me know. All right. Uh, take care of yourself because you deserve it.